lacrosse wasn't really big for in our high schools here in Atlanta, you know, when we were growing up. It's really big today. But I know you're super involved in growing the game of lacrosse for youth. You know, talk to us about, you know, that trajectory and and how to, you know, what's being done to, to make it continue to grow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a great question. It's robust, by the way, because a lot of things have to happen, come into place. Um, I think at a high level, you look at public and private funding. Um, It's one of the things that American football did better than any other contact equipment based sport. Right. Lower accessibility for lacrosse, hockey, golf, even baseball, because you have to have the means to pay for the equipment. American football is arguably more expensive, the technology of the helmets and shoulder pads, thigh pads and stuff. But they went the public route in the 20th century to uh, have all local municipalities fund our peewee equipment. That's incredible because sport is an equalizer and equalizer starts with access. And so there's the public route that can help grow the game. And then there's the private route. Folks like us who run the PLL, and we have a big youth division called PLL Play. Uh, We have a 501c3 that works with inner city programs, Boys and Girls Club, YMCA. Um, So it's like a full scale effort from a public private standpoint to to literally force the the access across the country and across the world. Uh, Coaching is often underrated, especially for stickball sports. Um, because kids play a sport primarily because they're having fun and a sport that is difficult to play means less fun out of the gates, therefore more likely to stop playing and coaching. You know, I grew up, my basketball coach, coach lacrosse, cause we didn't have any lacrosse players in the area. And he was like sort of figuring it out. And the big shift for me was actually by the time I was able to put some balls in the net, my freshman year in high school, we still had a basketball coach. And uh, DeMatha's head coach at the time came over and saw me play and talked to my parents about transferring. And I looked at the opportunity to play for him and that team, which is a top 10 program in the state of Maryland, uh, as an opportunity for me to learn from a great coach and acquire more skill faster. So I think coaching is a piece. And then the last one that I'll mention, speaking of you guys are in Atlanta and having hosted an Olympic, is uh, – we got the sport back into the Olympics for LA 2028. That was another full scale effort by a lot of us from development and design to pitching through LA 28, uh, the IOC, the USOPC. And what that's going to do for me is unlock some more public funding, not just in the U S but every Olympic nation that wants to build a lacrosse program. So holistic, robust, but hopefully that, uh, that's helpful in, in sort of understanding. Oh, one more thing from an education standpoint. Lacrosse is a Native American game, and it was created in the Six Nations, which is in the Northeast. They occupy part of what we know as New York and part of what Canadians know as Ontario. Um, and that game made its way into the U.S., first via Montreal, but made its way into the U.S. with NYU and Manhattan College. Then Johns Hopkins picked it up because they they were competing against NYU in Manhattan. This is the late 1800s. So that's where like New York and Maryland was formed. And again, because of the requisite of having to have a you know financier to get a sport to a level of what we've seen sort of the mainstream across America, we hadn't had that. Uh, until probably the last 10 to 20 years. Yeah, Paul, do you, do you see that? Was there a, I mean, it sounds like it was kind of a slow growth in Atlanta. I guess we just kind of felt it was just all the transplants coming down from the Northeast and, and, you know, them, them teaching their kids lacrosse and then those kids teach other. Do you see a tipping point in the last 20 years of where you said, okay, I think it's, I think it's really struck a chord here in this country? Um, yeah, I think so. I, you know, when, if I look at the history of sports in America and those that uh, proliferate, um, it's a bottom up and top down. So what you guys talked about is a bottom up approach. How do we get more youth programs um, all the way up through high school playing? I think high school sanctioning is really important. You get funding and you also get to wear your letter jacket in school, going back to like the value of what kids trade on. Yeah. 
Uh, there are only 23 states that have sanctioned lacrosse, so a public route of trying to get more states uh, to offer lacrosse such that they're not, you know, fundraised through car washes and stuff in a club program with the local kids with passion. Um, so I think that that's really important um, for us to help facilitate. Um, and then on the, um, you know, on, on, on the rest of the front of, of how or perhaps the tipping point, um, I think lacrosse players have done a really good job entrepreneurially getting to California and the Pacific Northwest and the Southeast and the Midwest to start lacrosse programs at affordable prices. Atlanta happens to be one of those hotbeds where I think there are some really great coaches. Um, Denver had Bill Tierney, who went out in 2015 to help build their college program, but the impact of him then winning a national championship there on local programs in, in Colorado was dramatic. Um, and then over the last five years since launching the PLL is where you add some jet fuel to the experiment in uh, trying to drive value to lacrosse top down. So without the emergence of the NBA in the 80s, the NFL in the 60s, Major League Baseball in the early 1900s, you wouldn't have seen baseball, football, and basketball take off at a youth participatory level like they did. Um, and we're hoping to do that at the PLL, uh, affecting the next generation of players. Tell us what your vision is for the PLL. Where is it going uh, over the next five to ten years? Where do you see this whole across, you know, world – you know, heading? Well, I'll start with our mission, which is to trailblaze the future of professional sports. It's player and fan focused. Um, and that lives across the way that we put on our games, our event weekend, how we broadcast the games, our partnerships, how we're accommodating our fans who are attending, um, the media and marketing associated with it, the give back to the community. Um, we want to innovate. And we feel that we have the ability to do that because we don't have 100 years of historical context or individual owners that are pulling for their own rights against each other. Um, so being able to actually start in 2018, which is when we announced the PLL, um, enabled us to say, hey, if Major League Baseball was built in 2018, how would it look? Um, and so that, that's the first part. Now, what we want to become, uh, talking about big goals and saying it, is a top five sports league in North America. And sort of the big four, if you call it, is baseball, basketball, football, and hockey. Um, and then maybe MLS creeps in there. The UFC is making a run. So it is, um, it's definitely a challenging goal. But we believe the other, the counterpoint to it is, what the MLS and UFC have done in the last 25 years, we think we can do in half because we have the ability to speed up because of the Internet, because of new technology, because of modern media like social and uh, platforms where you can build community much quicker and more affordably than you could have in the 90s. Um, and so that, that's that. Now, what it will look like for our players and our teams is higher wages more sponsorship revenue opportunity, more expansion, um, and a pretty exciting, uh, I think, few years in front of us as we look at the Olympics coming to the U.S. in 2028. 